Hello everyone, hope you're doing well and you're enjoying this um, session on invertebrate fossils. Welcome back indeed to Sedimentary Rocks and Fossils, where today we'll be continuing to look at in major invertebrate groups, or largely phyla, I suppose. Today's focus is going to be the brachiopods. These are shellfish that look a bit like bivalves, and indeed are often confused with bivalves, but are actually distinctly different. Um, so uh, the contents of this video is going to be the an introduction to this group as with the previous videos that we've had on major fossil groups and then a quick look at their biology so I hope it's going to be interesting for you. So what are brachiopods? You can see in this image uh, on the left a uh, fossil example and on the right a living example from this group. The, the one on the right is actually a member of a very famous um, subgroup of the brachiopods called the lingulids, which we'll learn a little bit more about in the next lecture. So brachiopods, in case you hadn't guessed from this image, are twin valved shellfish. You can see this most clearly in the middle picture here. There's one valve on the top here, uh, a line between the two there, and then a valve on the bottom. Sometimes these creatures are called lamp shells because they look like old oil lamps. They're an entirely marine group of animals. Uh, they live in the seas, uh, and so they filter feed in the sea with the aid of a complex and filamentous organ called the lophophore. This is a long kind of wafty thing that you can see when they open their shell. There's actually a really good example on the website for this particular part of the lecture course um, where you could actually see the lophophore inside a living brachiopod. Normally, but not always, the brachiopods have a structure called the pedicle. This is a, um, a kind of a fleshy structure which they use, well, generally, but not always, which they use to attach themselves to the substrate because these are sessile animals. They normally just sit around filter feeding attached to something. They're adapted to a wide range of different um, life strategies, um, largely on the seafloor. They're common as fossils, particularly as shown on the left, and some species are still alive today. Living brachiopods, in comparison to the, um, the fossil members of the group, are relatively rare. Their diversity in the geological past was far higher than it is today. They're most common in cryptic and deep water habitats, but they're actually found in a wide range of different um, environments from intertidal zones all the way through to the abyssal depths eking out a liver, living as filter feeders. The living groups are represented mainly by forms which attach by their pedicles to a variety of substrate, substrates across a wide spectrum of water depths. Whereas I suppose it's fair to say that in the fossil record, there was a slightly wider range of environments and modes of life on show. Uh, within the group, there's a wide range of shell morphologies and of sizes of these creatures. They go from um, individuals that are microns, so thousandths of a millimeter, several thousandths of a millimeter in length, but definitely smaller than a millimeter, all of the way through to ones which are up to half a meter wide. So that's a really wide range of different sizes within the group. As with the other um, invertebrate groups that I've been introducing you to, the next thing we're going to do is place these um, brachiopods on a evolutionary tree, a phylogeny, and within the Linnaean taxonomy. So the tree is shown on the right, and the Linnaean taxonomy is shown on the left. So let's start with the phylogeny of these creatures. As you can see, they are animals, they're bilaterian animals, they're bilaterally symmetrical. They are also a member of this clade called the protostomes, which we've covered a couple of times already, that's defined based on their embryology. And in particular, they're a member of a subclade of the protostomes called the Lophotrochozoa. It's not the nicest name in the world um, to remember, but it's a, it's a really important group that not only includes our brachiopods, which you can see here, a sister group to another group that we'll be mentioning and passing later in the course called the Bryozoa, but they are, these two are also closely related to annelid worms, the earthworms being a an example of those you may be familiar with, and the mollusks that we learned about in the last set of videos. We're fairly confident about this 
rhizome brachiopoda relationship here um, because these creatures share that lophophore, that um, uh, filter feeding uh, organ, and they have similar body cavities or colon, as we've mentioned, uh, a structure we've mentioned previously in the mollusks. There are actually some other groups that I've left out of this particular cladogram, this particular phylogeny, um, and exactly where they sit relative to those is still up in the air. And in fact, as you can probably see from my taxonomy here, there's quite a lot of, um, uh, of question marks there and of potential different classification systems. So the taxonomy of this group is actually surprisingly still up in the air. Traditionally, uh, until about the 1990s, so for about 100, 100 years before that, there were two classes. One was called the articulata, and the other was called the inarticulata. And this was based entirely on whether there was a hinge structure between the valves. The articulata had a nice hinge along which they opened, and the inarticulata didn't have a hinge, hence inarticulate. They are also the um, source of the, uh, the possibly the most disappointing paleontology uh, joke as a result, which is why did one brachiopod not speak to the other? Because it was inarticulate. Anyway, so that definition held until the 1990s, but subsequent work has changed this traditional idea. And there are now two other systems currently in play uh, regarding the taxonomy of this group. And I'll be introducing one of those in the next slide. So I should highlight the DNA has provided some clues as to their phylogeny that could ultimately then inform their taxonomy. But I guess one of the problems we have here is that there are so many extinct forms and we can't get DNA for the extinct forms that we're kind of limited as to what we can say um, based on the many, many extinct members of this group. And that's why we still argue about their taxonomy. So take that for all for what it's worth. There are either two classes or more than two classes. There are around 25 orders. It's very difficult to get a handle on how many families there are. There are about 120 living extant genera and at least 6,000 extinct ones. So as you can see, this is a group with a very, very strong fossil record. And species-wise, we're looking at about 350 living groups, but at least 12,000 extinct ones. So because the relationships within this group are in flux, I would be doing you a disservice if I tried to present you with a certain answer and say, this is how the brachiopods are related to each other. That would not be cool because it's not true. We just don't know at the moment. So I've put on this, um, on this slide for you two recent phylogenies um, that are actually fairly similar to each other. It looks like they are in broad agreement in most aspects. In general, we can say that the latest um, phylogeny suggests that the Brachiopoda are best split into three different groups, which are normally identified as subphyla, so they're, they're nested under that, that phylum Brachiopoda level. And they're marked on both trees here. Amongst them, you have the Linguliformia. Um, Linguliformians have uh, organophosphatic shells. I'll get onto what that means in the next video, but their shell is basically made of a form of phosphate. The other two groups are called the Craniformians and the Rhynchanelliformians. Horrible name again, sorry about that, named after Rhynchanelliforms. Not much we can do to avoid it because that's what they're called. Um, and both of those have calcareous shells. The differences between them I'll highlight again in the next video. The, the way these um, trees differ is in the right hand side, um, the tree here from a 2016 paper by um, S.J. Carlson actually has another phylum as in-group brachiopods. This is the phylum Foronida. These, these are weird animals called, um, oh, I think they're called horseshoe worms, but I, I wouldn't swear on that. I'll look it up and confirm for you in the next video that that is the case. But foronids are, are closely related to the brachiopods. If this topology right here is true, that would mean that the brachiopods aren't actually a monophyletic grouping, right? So the, uh, the foronids actually would sit within the brachiopods. Um, and that would mean that we'd have to rethink their, 
um, certainly their um, phylogeny, their kind of their cladistics in it, and their cladistic definitions are uh, somewhat, um, although that may not necessarily bleed over into the taxonomy. So those are two ideas of how the um, the major groups are related to each other. I think that the thing to notice that these have in common, uh, or I say that they don't actually have it in common, but they, they have in common that there are three clades, but um, it may be based on this phylogeny that the, uh, the craniata or the crania forms are most closely related to our lingular forms there. So take that for what it's worth. But it's, an, it's a, not a settled question yet. And that makes it really interesting and an exciting place to be working. So the Cambrians are quite, as the Cambrians, <laughs> oh man, I mean the Brachiopods, are quite an ancient group. They first appeared in the early Cambrian and they diversified throughout the um, Paleozoic. So from the Cambrian to the, um, the Permian, there were quite a few turnovers in the amount of Brachiopods that were around. And in recent years, there have been a number of exciting advances um, understanding Brachiopod origins that I just wanted to highlight for you here as part of their geological history. Uh, we currently believe that the this a kind of tubular form and a sessile life habit, so kind of not moving around that much, may have been the original state for the last common ancestor of this clay, the Lophotrochozoa as a whole. A cool example that um, impacts on our idea of brachiopod origins is a super well-preserved tubular fossil called Euganathica. It's shown here on the right hand side, it's this long thing there with um, bivalved shells at the top that's known from the early Cambrian Shenzhang Lagostata in Yunnan province in China. It's a lovely fossil. And what's really exciting about it is it has some pheronid and some brachiopod characters. So you remember that, um, that group that I said was in some phylogenies nested within the brachiopods. This creature looks like a mixture of both of those. At the bottom, it has a tubular attachment structure with a long pedicle. And as I've already mentioned, it has that pair of vel valves on the top, which house a horseshoe shaped lophophore, which is something you see in the pharaonids. Also, uh, recent work on the euphemistically named small shelly fossils, named because they're small and they're shelly and they're fossils, and we otherwise don't really know what they are, say that, but recent work has suggested that some of these small shelly fossils um, that are recovered from very um, from early Cambrian rocks, normally by um, dissolving the rocks in some form of acid and then looking at what's left, um, may well uh, explain the origins of the brachiopod. So basically what I'm saying is brachiopod origins may lie within members of this group, um, the small shelly fossils. In particular, there's one group called the Tomotiids, which look, which are shown here, which look superficially and in detail like they may well be very closely related to our brachiopods. So that's where we may have our origins of the brachiopods. There's really small creatures early in the Cambrian. Either way, um, we do can say that in the Paleozoic, uh, the brachiopods came to dominate the low level suspension feeding uh, benthos. So that's animals that are living on the seafloor. So I've created a, a diversity curve for you here again, as I've done with the other groups that we've looked at thus far over the course of these videos. And this is really interesting because as I've already mentioned with brachiopods, over 12,000 fossil species have been reported in some 6,000 genera. And there are about 350 or species in 120 genera around today. In other words, the fossil record accounts for more than 95% of brachiopod diversity, and that makes them a really interesting group for us paleontologists. In the Paleozoic, brachiopods dominated life on the seabed, both in terms of numbers of individuals and in terms of the number of species. So they were really, really successful. In fact, the ubiquitous components, really, uh, of all marine Paleozoic rocks where you find fossils. So for that reason, they're an important group for us paleontologists. And, that's, um, and they continue to vary um, in abundances since the Paleozoic, um, with some later periods where they are not uncommon, but never really when they were quite as successful as they were in the Paleozoic, in this Cambrian, especially through to kind of Ordovician, through to Permian, where they really, really did well for themselves as a group. <laughs> 
So that is the brachiopods. And as I've said, they're useful to us geologists. Normally at this point, I would say how they're useful to us as humans. I've done that in the other groups. And the sad answer is that apart from for scientific research, because they're not so common nowadays, um, the brachiopods aren't so useful to us as living day humans. Some, they, they are a source of food in some parts of the world, but it's not that common because they're not that common themselves. So there you go, take that for what it's worth. So I wanted to finish uh, by talking about um, why they show this really interesting dynamic of being having been so popular and they're so popular, well, not popular, successful, but why they are no longer so successful. If we were to map individual forms to the different time periods, um, as you can see in this diagram here, we, can, we would be able to identify three general time periods based on the taxonomic composition. So you've basically got three major chunks of time um, which you can identify commonalities within the brachiopods. And those would be the early, the mid late, and the post Paleozoic. The Cambrian, the Silurian, and the Triassic periods are transitional, transitional uh, in terms of their composition. So they're the transitions between those three groupings of when we see different kinds of, of brachiopods around. And you see those here. So uh, one grouping, second grouping, and then third grouping. So there are these, these big turnovers at different points in the fossil record of the brachiopods. In the Paleozoic, each of those kind of time periods is marked um, at the beginning and the end by a notable diversification and extinction within the brachiopods. And in general, the post-Paleozoic is marked by a much lower and gradually declining diversity within this group. It's a bit sad. A key thing to note is that the end Permian um, extinction, that we've um, covered in a few of the other groups already, this really big event where up to 95% of the species died, really had a big impact on brachiopods. It reset brachiopod diversity, morphology, and ecology permanently. And they are, are a fundamentally very different group after this event to what they were before. A proposed reason for this is that immobile suspension feeders um, that's brachiopods living on soft substrates declined because of disruption from infernalization and biotubation. So things living in the sediment and burrowing uh, have made it more difficult post PT for uh, things like brachiopods to eke out their mode of life. And certainly we can say that living brachiopods tend to be those that attach to hard substrates. So maybe, maybe there was a change in things mode of life here. It's also notable that during the Mesozoic, bivalves have become more common as fossils, and thus it's tempting to, and many people have for quite a long time, uh, think that the bivalves outcompeted the brachiopods. Is this true? Well, I wanted to highlight um, that what you're looking at there is a correlation between two things, right? And I want you to pay attention to this because I think this is really important. Um, correlation does not imply causation, right? So as an example of that, I've got this wonderful graph here that I found on the internet that is showing a correlation between the number of people who dry, drowned in the USA by falling into a swimming pool compared to the number of films Nicolas Cage has appeared in. Those two are correlated. You can see that these, these lines follow each other very, very closely, right? That doesn't mean that the number of films Nicolas Cage is appearing in is causing people to drown in swimming pools, right? There is no mechanism to suggest that. I mean, you may want to sit down and have a think about whether you can think of one, but really, it, it doesn't really make sense, right? And as such, when you have a correlation, you can't then just say that one thing is causing the other. And so in this case, we can't say that the um, impact of bivalves is causing a reduction in the number of brachiopods. And I, I'll highlight this in the last video for you in a bit more detail about why we can't say that and why that may not be the case. But in the meantime, what I want you to do is remember this in everything that you do. If you're working in any form of scientific field whatsoever,
Remember this in everything you do. Correlation between two things doesn't imply that one is causing the other. A really obvious way in which this may not be the case is if the two things are being caused by a single underlying mechanism that's making them correlated, but those two aren't causing each other. They share a common cause that's underlying both. But there are many other ways that that could pan out. But just remember, when you're looking at stuff, um, anything scientific, and indeed when you're watching the news and thinking about many of the um, issues in life that, that we face, that correlation does not always imply causation. That's a really strong and important message to leave this uh, video on, and I'll be going into, in the next video, a little bit about the um, morphology of the brachiopods, so I'll see you there in just a short while.